Anybody here ever go to Bible college? I feel like it. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you went to church here, you did. Well, I guess. I never got to go either, but that's all right. I'm a if you ever do go, they teach. I go. I go. <laughs> you go? <laughs> There's certain principles of God's Word that people really need to know when they study. And, it, you know, God said to rightly divide the Word of God, and He also said you're to study it. Right. You're to study it as you rightly divide it and put it in the right places. And then there is, there's other principles like the law first mentioned, and the types and the shadows and the numbers. I mean, there's different principles. But the progressive revelation is awesome because what it speaks about is, well, exactly what it says, progressive. It's a revelation of God. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ to man. And he's, he, he reveals himself from the very beginning all the way through. That's why it always amazes me how some of these denominations and some of these religions believe that you should take out the Old Testament, or at least not study it, especially the first 11 chapters, which they are now calling a myth, where Jesus Christ is revealed all the way through the Old Testament. And if you look at these verses at the top of your page, <coughs> it says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, this is Jesus, this is after he rose from the dead, and he, and he was walking down the road of Emmaus. He said, the beginning of Moses and all the prophets. Now, where is the beginning of Moses? That would be the first five books. Ooh, right. Genesis all, and the first five books. So, the beginning of Moses in Genesis and then all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Jesus is revealed through not only the first five chapters or first five books, but all the way through the scriptures, and it's progressive. And as we see these pictures coming to life just in the first two, three chapters of Genesis, it should excite our soul to see that God was revealing himself, the Lord God was revealing himself. And Luke 24, 44 says, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. And that would include all the feast days and, and all the holy days and all the numbers and all the different things that we have studied in this class. And all the uh, sacrifices, the burnt offerings, all of those things. It, it, it was all a way to reveal Jesus Christ to man. So he said, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. So it was what? Concerning me, he said. Right? Then in uh, John 5, 39, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So if we could stop here for just a minute, what scriptures is Jesus talking about? They didn't have the New Testament. So when he was speaking of these, and he said, beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, and then he said, search the scriptures, they're all about me. What scriptures was he talking about? He was talking about the Old Testament. Okay? Say, so search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then Colossians 2, 16 and 17 says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of a holiday, or the new moon, or the Sabbath days. You can see he's speaking to Jews, because your first converts were Jews. <laughs> okay? And he said, which are what? A shadow. A shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There can't be a shadow without the body. And there can't be a shadow without a light. There has to be a light. So you can see it's all representing Jesus Christ all the way through the Old Testament. You have to have the light. You have to have the body to make the shadow. And the shadow speaks 
of Jesus Christ. How awesome that is. So if you look at, look at it this way, and I want us to get the right mindset as we go into the rest of this study. The progressive revelation. You need the light for a shadow to appear. In the beginning, God. There's the first one we see with Elohim. We've already discussed this. And we find it in John 1, 1 through 3, where he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We know he's speaking of Jesus Christ. He is the Word. Okay? And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in the beginning was the Word. So it says, for by him were all things created. So we see Jesus in Elohim. We see him in the beginning, in that first verse. We see him as the creator of all things. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him in the beginning. <laughs> okay? And then we have number two, the bride coming from the wounded side of Adam, as we're going to look at today. The bride came from the wounded side of Adam. The blood and water that poured out of the side of Jesus Christ, the bride of Christ, came from that blood that was shed on Calvary. It says in John 19, 34, but, of, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. Blood and water. So when we look at Adam today, when we look at this wounded side, we need to understand that Eve was in Adam. All were in Adam. That is why Satan tempted Eve. Okay? Now, Eve would fall, but all mankind couldn't fall through Adam. It, I mean, through Eve, it had to be through Adam. But how he knew he couldn't get to Adam, so he went to Eve to get to Adam. You understand? Okay. He knew he couldn't get to Adam. I mean, what kind of man was Adam to begin with? We're going to look at that here for just a minute. And you're going to look at Adam a different way. So he, he went after Eve because he knew he could get to Adam through Eve. Because Adam loved Eve so much, she came out of him. She's part of him, just like we are part of Christ. We came, we came out of his wounded side. We are part of him. He is in us and we are in him. We are one. And that's the way Adam and Eve were one. But they were created. It's, it's different from anything else ever before. They were the only two who were created that way. Because everybody else came from what? Them. <laughs> After their own kind. After their own kind. So we see the bride coming from the wounded side. That was a progressive revelation of Jesus Christ. Then we see the seed of the woman that we'll look at next week in Genesis 3.15. That's the promise, the first promise of the Redeemer. That's the first promise of the Savior, the seed of the woman. Another progressive revelation of Jesus Christ. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. He said it would be the seed of a woman, not of man, the seed of a woman, okay? And he told him in, in the Old Testament, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And then Matthew 1, 23, he said, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. So we see a progressive revelation of Jesus Christ just in Genesis in the first chapter and in the second chapter, in the third chapter, all the way through God's Word, you should be looking for that revelation of Jesus Christ. So we see him revealed in the beginning. We see him revealed in the wounded side, the bride coming out of Adam. We see him revealed in the bride and the groom, the church. We see him in the seed of woman that we'll study next week. And then we also see him in the coats of skins. And I know you've all read the story over and over again. You know when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to make a uh, covering for their sin, which was the first type of man working for his own salvation to make himself presentable before God. And it was interesting as I was studying these words, 
that the apron that they made, the word for apron is a belt. Couldn't cover a whole lot with a belt. <laughs> okay. right? But the coats of skin, that's a totally different word. And it means robe. He clothed them. And here we see another progressive revelation of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And how he, the Lord took the innocent animal, which I believe to be a lamb, but he took the innocent animal and he made a robe for them. And it's important for us to understand this. He provided it. He provided it. Okay? He's, he, uh, the Bible teaches about how in the, in the book of Genesis where it speaks about Abraham, and he said, don't worry, son, the Lord will provide himself a lamb. He provided the clothing. He provided the salvation. It came from God and God alone, not of works, not of any works. So he provided the lamb. He is the one who killed the lamb. We need to understand that too in Isaiah. It teaches us that it was God the Father who slew the son. Okay? And he, he did it willingly, and the son did it willingly. So we see there again is progressive revelation of Jesus Christ. So the coats of skin, God provided them, not the works of man's hands. But we also need to understand as we read that verse, God dressed them. Do you realize they didn't dress themselves? That when he slew the lamb, if you read that verse and study those words, what those words mean... When he slew the animal, he wrapped them in those bloody skins. He clothed them. He clothed them. So salvation comes from him and him alone without any works of man at all. None. That is, again, progressive revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we study the book of Genesis, we see he is revealed in every story in every chapter of God's Word. Now let's look at this on page 14 if you have it. Just a couple things I want to go over again. You'll have to excuse me. I don't have a whole lot of breath, but I want to finish this. The order of things. God has an order, and we talked about this last week. God has an order in creation. He has an order of everything. He likes things done in order. And because he is a God of so many patterns and so many types and so many shadows, everything has to be precise. Okay? So he had an order of things. And first, he created the man, then the garden for man. And remember, Eden was already there. He created the garden east, in the eastern part of Eden. Okay? You need to read that. In the eastern part of Eden, he provided... He, he, planted a garden for Adam. Now, was it in God's heart that Eve was going to be created? Absolutely, the very same day. But he had things and he did things in order for a reason, for a purpose. God has an eternal purpose. So the order of things was first he created man. As we talked about last week, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. Adam means earth man. And breathed into him the nostrils in his nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Eternal life comes from God, okay? The body is from the dust, and the living soul and the spirit from God. And when a person dies, the Bible says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Okay, so as we said last week, and I always say this, the, the true person never goes into that coffin. That true person never goes into the ground. The person that God gave life to goes straight home to be with him. And if he's lost, he goes straight to hell. I mean, we've got to look at the flip side, too. All right? So God created man. Then he created the garden. It says, and the Lord God planted the garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. All right? And then he, he made a covenant with Adam. Adam was the head figure. He was the man. God made the covenant with Adam. Adam was responsible for Eve. Adam was responsible for the garden. Adam was the head. Okay? And so he describes, he, he made the covenant with man. 
And then he named, he gave the, he gave all the animals to Adam for Adam to name. We read over this last week. And it says, And God said, Let us make man in their image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Then it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. He created Adam first before Eve, okay? And then he, he placed him in the garden. He made a covenant with him. He brought all the animals to him. And then he named the animals, all right? Why? Why would he do it in that way? Because he wanted Adam to see that he was not complete without a mate. He wanted Adam to see the need there. If you look on page 15, look what it says. Lord God said it is not good for man uh, to be alone, should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. Now God had already planned, had always planned, that there would be Adam and Eve. I mean, it was the eternal purpose of God. It was always in his plan to make Adam and Eve. Eve. God knew that Adam would be incomplete without Eve. Okay? But he wanted man to see it was not good for him to be alone. So he put Adam in the garden. It says, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help me for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowls of the air, to every beast of the field. But look, but for Adam, there was found, there was not found a helpmeet. God wanted Adam to see that. Okay? God wanted him to see that. He wanted Adam to see his need. That each creation was to procreate after its own kind. Adam didn't have one after his own kind. And for him to produce, he had to have a mate. And God wanted him to see that need and want that need. So God had already knew he was, he was not complete, but he wanted Adam to see that. So she was not an afterthought. <laughs> I've heard a lot of jokes, usually from Baptist preachers. <laughs> but <laughs> she was not an afterthought. <clears throat> I know we had that one Baptist preacher who said, God looked at man and said, I can do better than that. <laughs> Greedy, but anyway, he wanted to see, he wanted man to see it was not good for him to be alone. So God, uh, G, uh, I'm sorry, she was not an afterthought for God's thoughts are complete. The eternal plan for man and woman to be created and then replenish the earth. I mean, that was part of the covenant. They were to replenish the earth. Could not come, could not be done without Eve. So it was always in God's plan. And when it says it's not good, it meant it was unfinished. He wanted Adam to see it was unfinished, it was incomplete, it was unfulfilled, that there had to be a mate for Adam. So woman was created in God's image as stated in Genesis 2, 27. A help me, that means suitable for. You know, can you think about it? God chose and created Eve for Adam. Yeah. And gave her to him. Okay? You can imagine how much Adam loved her. She came out of him. Okay? So God created uh, Eve in his image, just like he created Adam in his image, but he took the rib out of Adam to do that. A helpmeet to be suitable just for Adam. So a woman came from man just as the church came from Christ out of his wounded side. She was part of of him as we are part of Christ. And God, God designed marriage to be like that. That they would be one. That they would be one. And the Bible speaks of, of Adam being a type of Christ and we're going to see the many different types of Christ in Adam. But it tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even unto them that had not sinned against after the similitude of Adam's transgression. But look what it says, who is a figure or a type 
of him that was to come. Adam was a type of Christ. Okay? Now, Adam, let's look at how many different ways he was a type of Christ. Adam was a type of the groom, and he was a type of Christ. Eve is a type of the bride, or a type of the church. And God, of course, is God the Father. So in Genesis 2.21, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, like death. Okay? And he slept. And he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. So out of his wounded side, he took that rib. That's where his bride came from. And the rib which the Lord God taken from man made he woman, and look, and brought her unto man. It's like a wedding. The father giving the bride unto the groom. It was a gift brought her unto the man. And it says that when he made her, he built her surely. She was made for the man to fit properly with the man, to be his helpmate. Man was not finished without her. Okay? Now, what we need to think about Adam. What kind of man was he? What kind of man was Adam? In 2 Corinthians 11, 2, God speaks about the church, the bride. He says, I am jealous over you with God and jealous, for I have espoused or engaged you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's speaking of the church. We see the first wedding in the book of Genesis, and we have God the Father bringing the bride to the groom. All right? And even the very same vows, I mean, we're going to read this. <clears throat> the Father institutes the marriage. He brings the bride unto the groom. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. What man? Him. <laughs> okay. She was taken out of man. Woman means Isha, which means out of man. She was in Adam. So when Adam fell, of course she fell. And all, everybody who was born after Adam, including all of us, we are born fallen. Okay? We are born fallen. But Eve was made and given to Adam. It says, Therefore shall he leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall be one flesh. This is God's design for marriage. They shall be one flesh. And they were both naked and the man and his wife were not ashamed. Why? They were innocent. A baby never feels ashamed when it strips naked and runs down through the grocery store. <laughs> Why? Is the baby's innocent. They were innocent. They were innocent. They did no sin. They were innocent. But remember last week when we talked about God preparing that garden, and he told Adam in that first covenant that we talked about last week, that he was not only to keep it, he was, he was to guard it. Keep means to guard it. Why? Because it was evil on the outside of the garden. He told him to till it, which meant to farm it, but he also told him to keep it, which is a totally different word. So he had a lot of responsibility, Adam did, in the garden. Of Eden. Not only the garden, but now his wife. He was responsible for his wife, as you are responsible for your wife. Okay? So he was to leave his father, leave his mother. Of course, Adam didn't have a father and a mother. He only had a father. <laughs> but would Adam be willing to leave the father for the bride? I mean, these are just some questions. I just want you to mull it over in your head and give some thought to this. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Well, would Adam love his wife enough to give himself for her? And Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And then Ephesians 5.30 says, for we, his bride, are members of his body. We're talking about Jesus Christ. The bride being the church, and he is our groom. It's 
For we, his bride, are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And this is what Adam said when, she, when God brought the wife. He said, you are now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. But here, this is the New Testament. We're in Ephesians. Who told all Adam all of this? Who told Adam all of this? God. God. Why? Do you know? Do you remember where it says that he walked in the cool of the day? Talking with them. Can you imagine he walked in the cool of the day talking with them? How much did Adam know? I mean, Adam was no dummy. And let's remember he had created the stars. Remember, Adam knew all the names of the stars and the story was in the stars. Adam was no dummy. He was created by God. He was created perfect. He had much knowledge. What kind of person was Adam? He was not a sinner. He, he was not a rebellious sinner. And the Bible said he wasn't deceived. Why would he eat that fruit knowing what was going to happen? Why? Why? It says, uh, For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Adam and Eve were to be one flesh. Then it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. We are his bride. He is the bridegroom. Even John the Baptist said in John 3, verse 29, he said, He that hath the bride, the church, is the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. But the friend of the bridegroom, John, who was not part of the church, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Here we have, it says, This my joy therefore, therefore is fulfilled. Here we see how what a joyous thing it was. This wedding, what a joyous thing it was. God the Father had taken the bride out of the groom. He had formed her. He had built her. And then he presents her to the groom. Do we see the church in this? Yes, we see the church in this. Let's go on. And let's look on your next page. So Adam is the type of Christ. And also a contrast to Christ. I mean, he is, he is progressively revealing himself in every book of this Bible. Every book. So he is a type of Christ and also a contrast of Christ. Now Christ is called the second man and the last Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. It says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Praise God. Mm -hmm. How be it, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Adam was natural, not spiritual. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Okay? The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. Adam was a type, a figure of Jesus Christ who was to come. Okay, so Christ is called the second man and the last Adam. Christ is superior in every way. For why? He is God. He is God. Jesus is spiritual. Adam is natural. Jesus is heavenly. Adam is of the earth. Adam is a living soul. Christ is a life-giving spirit. There's a contrast. In Adam all die. In Christ all live. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, but we see God's design for marriage here. Speaking of the church, the church, Christ's bride. It's a love story of all times. No greater love story. God gave the covenant to Adam before Eve was even created. He was responsible. He is responsible for his wife. She was a gift given to him. He was responsible for her. And then Eve was created. The roles of each were decided before the foundation of the earth. Now let's look at the marriage picture. Christ is the head of the man. Man is the head of the woman. Not to rule over her with an iron fist. I mean, Adam didn't run around the garden with a whip. <laughs> okay? Not to rule over her with an iron fist, 
but to cherish and love her, to protect her, and share a life together. It's a beautiful picture. And I can remember as a kid growing up how it was taught, and I, and I know they took it out of context, but it was taught that it didn't matter what the man did. He could beat you. He could beat the kids. It didn't matter what he did. You were to be obedient and do whatever he said. And I mean, he just cracked a whip and you were to bow down. That's not what God meant when he made Eve for Adam. Absolutely not. Some man came up with that, believe me. God, it's a beautiful love story. The two were to become one. And if the two are one, there should, I mean, yeah, there's going to be little disagreements. But if the two are one, they want the same thing. They want the same thing. You hear people say all the time, well, if I have to decide between my children and my husband, I'm going with my children, or I'm going with my husband. If you have to decide between your children and husband, there's something wrong with your marriage. Right. Right? <laughs> Because the two are supposed to be one, and both of them care for the children. You know? But he is the head. He is the head. And he is the one who is responsible. So Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Not to rule over her with an iron fist, but to cherish her, to love her, to protect her, and share her life together. You say, well, the woman has no responsibilities at all. Yes, she does. She does. They are to be one life, unity and respect, caring for one another. Both have equal roles of importance, yet different roles, <laughs> and a need for each other to really be complete. It's a beautiful, beautiful love story. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. The women have responsibility. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Christ loved his church as his own body and was willing to lay down his life to save her. Did Adam love his bride that much? Did he? Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. See, we each one have responsibilities, the wife and the husband. Each one. But it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Does that mean Adam loved his wife so much that he'd be willing to give himself for her? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do believe that. Now, after he sinned, there was a change. Because remember, after he said immediately, what did he do? He blamed the woman. And he blamed God for giving them. I mean, you see a whole change in the nature as soon as, right. as, soon as the sin comes into the picture. You get me? Yeah. As soon as he disobeyed God, as soon as he sinned, things changed a little. Well, that woman, you gave me. You know, you see a totally different. Why? Because now sin had entered the picture. There wasn't that unconditional love that there was before sin. There wasn't that unconditional love that there was before sin. Sin entered the picture. Okay? So they would be one. Consider this. Ephesians 5.32 says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. She holds him up. You know, there's different needs in a man or a woman, and the man needs to feel. Man has an ego. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Mom used to say you can build them up or you can tear them down. <laughs> That's what she used to say, and that is so true. And a man needs that. He needs to feel that he's reverenced by his wife. And that doesn't mean that she bows down when he comes in. Okay? But that she reverences him as he is the head of the house. Even as unto the Lord. I mean, that is a beautiful picture. And that's the way it's supposed to be. So now you can see why the world is in such a mess. Because everything is out of God's order. But it's all out of God's order. Okay? But when God gave it, it was a beautiful picture and a beautiful... I mean, the man loves you that much. 
I mean, you want to reverence him. You want to reverence him. And this is the way it was before sin. Okay, before sin. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and wife see that she reverence her husband. Cleave means to be intertwined, woven together, stuck to, adhered to. You're one. You're one. Okay? So what is the great mystery? That man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, even if it cost what? His life. Did not Christ leave the father and come down here? As a man to die for all, he did. He did. Jesus Christ, the spotless Son of God, willing to leave his Father and come into a world of filth to save a fallen, unfaithful wife, dying of a terrible death on the cross to deliver her. He was willing to come and die. Was Adam to love his wife like that? Yes, he was. That's what love is all about. Paul says he was a type of Christ. He was to love his bride as his own body and be willing to leave the Father to die for her. She was given to him by God. She, she came from his own body. He loved her as his own life. Now look at the next page. So then why did the tempter come to Eve instead of Adam? Why? Eve's falling would not involve the whole race. I mean, think about that for just a moment. Eve's falling wouldn't involve the whole race. For she was not the head. Eve fell as an individual, not as a whole mankind. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that nevertheless death reigned from Eve to Moses. Or that the disobedience of Eve caused these things. All right. He went after Eve to get to Adam. All right. So Eve falling would not involve the whole race, for she was not the head. Eve fell as an individual, not as the whole mankind. Satan knew the one way to get to Adam was through his bride, for Adam would not be swayed. Just as, as Satan knows the way to get to Jesus Christ is through his church, through his bride, through his children. That's how to, that's how to get to God. He knew how to get to God was through his children. And we all know that as parents. Oh, yes. I mean, how can you hurt us the most? Through our children. So Satan knew that one way to get to Adam was through his bride, for Adam would not be swayed. Now, how much did Adam know? He knew it all. He knew God as no other human would ever know him. He knew God was holy, and he knew the penalty of sin was death. He knew. You know, even as a parent, myself, who's no perfect parent at all, when I would tell my children that they were not to do something, I would explain to them. I can remember getting down on my knees before Larry. Larry, now if you do this, Mommy's going to spank you. Do you understand? Yes. Repeat after me. Do not pull the wheat, the carrots out of the garden. Okay, I won't. And what's going to happen if you do? You're going to spank me. Why? I wanted him to understand. Don't you think God wanted Adam to understand that if you disobey me, you're going to die? Adam, do you understand that? Why? He was the perfect parent. The perfect parent. How much did Adam know? He knew, he knew God as no other human would ever know him. He knew God was holy. He knew the penalty of sin was death. Genesis 2.17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, are you listening to me, Adam? Thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, the day that thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die. Adam was no dummy. Adam was innocent. And he was without sin. He was created perfect. He was not rebellious, not till sin. He, nor was he willfully ignorant. He knew. He knew. He was brilliant. He was strong. He knew. He believed. He understood that if he disobeyed God, he would die. I mean, he understood that. He knew sin brought death. His death. And separation from the Father. He knew that. 
He knew sin would bring it. He, he knew a life was required if man disobeyed because he said, you will die. Okay? He knew that. He knew it was responsible for his bride. I give her unto you. Is she now bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh? <coughs> she came. He knew he was responsible for his bride. He knew when Eve sinned, she was under the curse of death, and he still being holy before God was now separated from his bride. Can you imagine? <coughs> she was deceived. But that means she still sinned. She transgressed. She stepped over. <laughs> but she was deceived. <laughs> that nowhere in the scripture does it say ever that Adam was deceived. What he did, he did of his own free will. Right. Not being deceived. Why would he do that if he wasn't a sinner? <laughs> Why? You understand where I'm going? Why would he do that? Look, can you imagine how he must have felt? When she ate that fruit, and now there she stood, lost and undone, with a death curse upon her and no hope, unless there was a child. It would have to be born a child. <laughs> they would have to for her salvation. I mean, he knew that. He knew they would have to be a child. But they couldn't be a child. They were separated. Right. They were separated. He couldn't lift her up. <laughs> He had to lower himself down. Mm -hmm. You get that? Mm -hmm. He had to lower himself down. Let's, let's finish this. He knew a life was required of man disobeyed. He knew he was responsible for his bride. He knew when Eve sinned, she was under the curse of death. And he still being holy before God was now separated from his bride. He knew communion between them was now broken as she stood there lost, fallen, without hope. He knew there was a great gulf of sin between them now. He knew he could not raise Eve back to his level. He knew Eve needed the Redeemer and was the only one who could give birth. He knew he would have to lower himself to her level, leave the Father, assume her guilt, and become partaker of her sin and condemnation. And then only could he become the father of the child? Wow. He knew this. Now, did Adam love his wife that much? Was he willing to give his life for her? See, Adam's, Adam's sin was different from all others. We're, we, are, we are not sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. He wasn't a sinner. Understand? He chose willfully, when he saw his bride standing there undone, willfully to join her, just as Christ set aside his glory and willfully became a man and brought himself down lower even than the angels to us to die for us and in our place. Think of that. Think of that. Now, was Adam's sin sin? Yes. His sin was sin. And what did his sin cause? The whole fall of the human race. Eve's sin didn't cause the fall of the human race. It was Adam's sin that caused the fall of the human race. Because the human race came from Adam. And every child born from Adam from then on was born what? A sinner. And born what? In Adam's image. After Adam's likeness, Genesis tells us that in chapter 5, when, he, when Seth was born, he said they were born after Adam's image, after Adam's likeness, and every child from then on was born that way. How? With the sin nature that Adam didn't have when he was created. He didn't have that sin nature. Okay? What happened when Adam sinned? The Bible says, 1 Timothy 2.13, For Adam was the firstborn, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She sinned. I mean, that was a sin, no matter which way you look at it. That was a sin. But wherefore, as by one man's, one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And then Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more 
they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of the righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. He's always compared. One man Adam, one man Christ. One bride Eve, one bride the church. We can see it is a progressive revelation of him, as we'll see in next week's lesson, how it gets deeper and deeper, but yet more and more and more beautiful as the Lord reveals himself in Adam and in Eve and in the wedding and in the church and even in the salvation. So Adam willfully and with full knowledge of consequences, he wasn't stupid, he wasn't dumb deliberately took the fruit from her hand and did eat. The Bible said he hearkened unto her. And I've heard preachers say she was nagging him and all. <laughs> you do realize this all happened in the same day. And when he hearkened unto her, wonder what she was saying. I mean, she wasn't tempting him because the Bible says he wasn't deceived. <laughs> so what was she? Was she crying? Was her heart broken because of her condition? What she had done? Was she saddened because she, now she was separated from him? What, what did it mean? He hearkened unto her. He hearkened unto her. So his sin was different. His sin was different. But still sin. And it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace, for sin abounds grace, abounds that much more. Can you see Satan, how, how angry he must have been? How angry he must have been that, that, that Adam's willing to die for her, actually brought salvation in the long run. <laughs> Understand? Because it would be the seed of the woman eventually that would bring the salvation. So you can see how he, he just couldn't win. He just couldn't win. And it seemed like he's winning this battle and this battle and this battle. But the fact is, we win, he lost. He lost. And he loses it every time. Every single time. 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived. He was not deceived. He was not rebellious. He did not want to be like God. I mean, he knew better than all of those things. Why? Why did he sin? But the woman being deceived was in transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved and childbearing. They were told to replenish the earth. They couldn't replenish the earth if she was no longer there. I think God had this all planned. Be in eternity past, before he even created or laid the foundation of the earth, it was all in his plan. He knew what Eve would do. He knew what Satan would do. He knew what Adam would do. God knows all things, and there was a purpose in all of it, and a plan for all of it. Man had to be tested. Why? Because he was created in God's image. He was created in his likeness. He has the power of choice. There had to be a choice. <laughs> and God tests man not so God will know. When you hear preachers say that, and I've heard them, Joyce Myers are always saying that. Well, God brought that upon you to just see what you'd do. God already knew. And a lot of things God may allow to happen, but he didn't bring it upon you. You bring it upon yourself. <laughs> Looking at me. <laughs> I bring it upon myself. Upon myself. So Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. Look at the next page. Now Jesus went further. He loved his bride. He was willing to leave the Father. He was willing to come down to the level of man and die for his beloved. The, the product of sin could never take away sin. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. And he alone could do it. He alone. It had to be a sinless, perfect sacrifice. Now when Adam stooped Eve's, Eve's level, he sinned. Jesus knew no sin. He did even more than Adam. He never knew sin. Okay? The Bible says, For he made him to be sin for us who, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness 
righteousness of God in him. Therefore doth my Father love me because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. And then Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For every man. Now let's take it one step further. We return to the garden. Jesus Christ came as man, but also as servant. Right? Mm -hmm. Consider this. From eternity past, God did not take on the form of man. God the Son was not always man. He didn't become man until that baby was born in Bethlehem. All right? He, he wasn't man in heaven before this, ever, in eternity past. He was not man. Now think of this. Until the body was prepared for him in the womb of Mary, he was not man. He appeared often in the form of angel, but the eternal Son of God was not flesh. <laughs> okay? Till he came as Jesus Christ. So when he returned, will there ever be a time when he returns that he's no longer man? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why? Because of the love of his bride. And we'll see this. Philippians, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Question, Jesus came as a man. Now think of this, incarnated in a human body. Will he surrender that humanity? Did he surrender that humanity when he went back to heaven? No. Will he surrender his humanity when his work of redemption is complete? No. Will he return to the invisible spirit he was before he became a man? No. We know he set aside his glory when he came as man, and that was restored. The Bible tells us that because even in John 17, he prays, Lord, restore unto me the glory that I had before I came. Okay? But after the kingdom, now think of this, after the kingdom, after the white throne judgment, after the earth and the heavens are burned and the new heaven and new earth are created, he has every right to lay aside that humanity. <clears throat> okay? Because his job's not, I mean, he finished at Calvary, but he's coming back. And there's going to be a thousand year kingdom. Then there's going to be a last rebellion, and then there's going to be the white throne judgment. And then the earth is going to be burned. So does he go back? to what he was before he came back, before he came down as Jesus? I mean, he has every right to do that. Will he do that? Truth is, Jesus has chosen to remain subject unto the Father and be with his bride forever. Don't you think about that? Mm -hmm. He said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Matthew 19, 6 says, Wherefore, there are no more twain but one flesh. I'm in you and you're in me. He will always remain to be Jesus Christ. Always. Look at this I'm on the next page. Jesus Christ never broke a law. In the Old Testament, there's a law of the bond slave. In Exodus 21, let's read it. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free from nothing. Okay, 6,000 years. 6,000 years. After 6,000 years, he had every right to return. Okay? But look, six years a Hebrew is to be a servant and he's to be freed. And if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, and then his wife shall go out with him. So if he came in with a wife, he left with a wife. But if he didn't have a wife, and one was provided for him while he was there, when he left, she couldn't go with him. She had to remain with the master. Okay, let's finish reading. If his master had given him a wife, what did God do? He gave him a bride. Okay. And she hath borne him sons and daughters. The wife and the children shall be her masters. And he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door. 
He shall also bring him to the door and unto the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with it all. He would pierce him. He would pierce him, and he shall serve him forever. Think of that. When all things shall be subdued, 1 Corinthians 15, 28, unto him, then shall the Son also himself be what? Subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Why? He chose to be a bond slave. That's totally different from a slave. A bond slave is one who loved the master and loved his children and loved his wife enough to be willing to be that bond slave forever and ever and ever so that he could be with her and his family. That is unconditional love and was willing to be pierced for all to see forever and ever and ever his great love for us. Now how should we love him? How should we love him? It's beyond me. It's beyond me. Philippians 2, 6 says, Who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fa fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How much should the bride love and admire him? Every time we look at those scars forever and ever and ever, we know that he was pierced. And we will be able to do that forever and ever and ever because he is the bond's slave, the bond's servant. We're going to stop here because we're using up the time. Next week, we'll go to the temptation. And I want you to, as you study these, 